Hello everyone and welcome to our Sunday YouTube service for August the 2nd at Ingleton Evangelical Church. We've actually moved our main Sunday meetings onto Zoom now, so it's not a, a recorded sermon specifically for YouTube this one, but it's one that we recorded whilst doing the YouTube, sorry, the, the Zoom service live. So we recorded that and that's the video that you'll see as you watch on through this morning. It won't look that much different to how it normally looks on here actually. Uh, as usual, if you're a visitor, it's great to have you. Uh, if you would like to join us on Zoom next Sunday, please let us know. Uh, contact myself at ingletonpastor at gmail.com and we'd love to welcome you to Zoom. Or you could just keep watching on YouTube as well. We'll keep posting the Sunday services and the talks on here. As usual, at the end this morning, uh, there will be a playlist that you can listen to. You can head back to the main YouTube channel page and go to playlists and find some songs there that will uh, follow on from this morning's service. So now you're going to hear the reading from Mark chapter 4. We're continuing in Mark and this morning we're looking at uh, the, the parable of the sower in Mark chapter 4 and what parables are all about. So the reading first and then from there it'll be straight into uh, the talk. Um, I'm going to read now from Mark's Gospel. So we're going to continue in Mark this morning and it's Mark chapter 4. So if you have a Bible that would be great. Mark chapter 4 and it's the, the parable of the sower that I'm going to read from verse 1 through to verse, uh, we'll go to verse 9. We're going to look at quite a bit more of that chapter actually this morning so again if you have a Bible keep it open as we move through the service because I'll refer to bits later in the chapter as well but I'm going to read now from Mark chapter 4 and verse 1 through to verse 9. Again Jesus began to teach beside the sea and a very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea and the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land and he was teaching them many things in parables and in his teaching, he said to them, listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil. And immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched. And since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns. And the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let me begin by asking uh, Do you like a, a good story? Do you like a good story? I think most of us probably enjoy a good story. Uh, sometimes it's a story being told through a, a TV program. Uh, but best of all, I think, is if you find a really good book and you can get engrossed in a story there. I'll admit that doesn't happen too much for me anymore. I think the, the extent of the stories I hear are, are Mr. Men's stories at the moment at about 10 to 7 at night. Uh, but they're still good fun. I still enjoy it. I enjoyed the story of uh, Miss Twin and Miss Twin the other day. He said everything twice at the end of a sentence sentence. It was brilliant. We enjoy a good story. And Jesus told stories too. He told stories throughout his ministry. Stories about farming. Uh, stories about families. Stories about the workplace and everyday settings. All of those things would have been uh, ideas, or at least settings, that his hearers were familiar with. And Jesus has a name for these stories that he told. The Bible has a name for them. They're called parables, and I'm sure we're all familiar with many of those parables. He spoke in parables. There's a few of them in Mark chapter 4 that we're going to look at uh, now this morning. Uh, a couple of them are about arable farming, uh, and there's one about mustard seeds, which is to do with farming and growing things as well. Uh, but there's a question to ask, and, and chapter 4 poses this question and answers it for us, Mark chapter 4. And that's what's the point of parables? What's the point of the stories that Jesus told? It's a question that might seem like it has an obvious answer, uh, but 
Perhaps part of the answer isn't as obvious as we might think. On initially being asked that question, we might go back to the kind of Sunday school age and come up with an answer like this. What were the point of Jesus' parables? Uh, they were stories that Jesus told that made it easy for the people listening to understand the truths about God that he taught. Uh, stories to make things easier to understand. Like when a, a preacher uses a, a good illustration in a sermon. If it is a good one, it's not just a, a story that people will remember later. It's a story that will have helped them understand the truth about God's word, about the gospel, about who God is and the Lord Jesus Christ is. But nevertheless, is that really a full explanation of what parables are? Is it really a full explanation? Uh, let me tell you a story now, for example. Let me tell you a story about one summer's day in Ingleton, uh, when there's a whole group of people gathered on the main green in Ingleton Village Centre. Uh, these people get up and set off to go on a walk up Ingleborough Mountain. Off they go. Some of them, though, only basically get as far as Clapham Old Road before they give up and sit down. Another group manage to keep on going as far as Criner Bottom. Uh, they enjoy the walk, but they get to Criner Bottom and decide, no, nope, this is as far as we want to go and no further. They sit down and have a picnic. Yet another group get all the way to the top. They summit Ingleborough and enjoy the view. But there's one or two who unfortunately twist their ankles, have to call out Mountain Rescue, who come and rescue them and get them back down the mountain. That's the end of the sermon. You may now all go home. What would you make of that? Think anything was being taught there in particular? What do you think my meaning was in telling that little story just then? It seems odd, doesn't it? But if you put yourself in the shoes of that large crowd of people who were sat by the sea one day in Mark 4, and as Jesus began to tell his parable of the sower in verses 3 to 8, I guess they would have felt a little bit at the end of it, like you probably felt after I just told a story about some people trying to climb Ingleborough. Because if the parable was the only part of Jesus' teaching that you heard, just verses 3 to 8 that were read earlier, would you have the faintest idea what he intended you to understand by it? I wouldn't, I don't think. I would have no idea uh, what it was that, that Jesus was actually teaching. I'll just read the verses again. We, we're so familiar with them that we tend to know exactly what they mean. But again, put yourself in the shoes of the listeners that first time. Listen, the sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. Now, if that was me, I'd be wondering why Jesus had gone from calling sinners, forgiving sinners, healing illness, casting out demons, preaching repentance and belief in the good news, to giving a lecture on agriculture. On the surface, all this parable talks about is some seeds growing and some seeds not growing. And that's about it. We can read on, of course, in Mark's Gospel, to find an explanation of the parable. And it's a, a profound parable with deep spiritual meaning, and we get to that just a few verses later. We hear the explanation if we're ready to listen. But that explanation, remember, was just given to a tiny number of people who heard it originally. For the vast majority, all they heard from Jesus that day was just a strange little lecture on planting seeds on whether they grew or not. I should think most people probably thought, okay, fair enough, but what's the point? So let's return to the question, what's the point of parables? The answer Jesus gives comes in two parts, and the first part will surprise us, I think, if we're not familiar with it already. The first part of Jesus' answer to why he uses parables is, 
is in order to keep God's truth a secret from some. It's in order to keep God's truth a secret from some. That sounds a bit shocking, but it's exactly what Jesus says in verses 11 and 12. See, even the 12 disciples didn't understand why Jesus had told the story about sowing seeds at first. So they ask him about parables in verse 10. Now, given Jesus' answer, their question must have been along the lines of, why do you use parables, Jesus? Why don't you just use plain, old, normal language to explain what you mean? Why hide it in a story like this? Well, here's Jesus' answer in verses 11 and 12. He said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see, but not perceive, they may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. That's probably not how we're used to thinking of parables. Jesus spoke in parables precisely so that some people wouldn't understand. That they would, they would see but not perceive, hear but not understand. <coughs> And therefore would not be forgiven. This is what Jesus says. It might sound a little disturbing, but we can't hide God's word when it says things plainly like this. So why would Jesus deliberately hide the gospel in parables from certain people? Well, we need to keep Jesus' words in the context of what we've already seen in Mark's gospel. What have we seen just before this, the last time we were in Mark, actually on a Sunday morning? Well, we've seen various people consistently rejecting Jesus. They heard his plain teaching about repentance and faith in him. But instead of repenting and believing in him, they accused him of being demon possessed. They accused, in effect, the Holy Spirit of being the devil himself, as we saw at the end of chapter three. So Jesus hides in parables the gospel from those who said, we do not believe you, so you are who you say you are. We do not believe that you should be our king. We thoroughly reject you. We believe that you belong to the devil. Jesus' response to such an emphatic rejection of him is to say, well, in that case, I, I won't speak plainly to you. I'll hide my teaching in parables. Uh, when Jesus says what he says in verse 12, he was actually quoting from the Old Testament. He was quoting from the book of Isaiah. You see, God had said something like this before. He said it to his Old Testament people, Israel. The first five chapters of Isaiah describe a people who flatly refuse to turn back to God. They reject him utterly. Here's how they're described in Isaiah 5 verse 20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Does that sound familiar from the end of Mark 3? Who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. So calling good evil, that's exactly what some people have done with Jesus and the Holy Spirit at the end of chapter 3. They'd accused the perfectly good Holy Spirit who is God, who indwelt the perfectly good Jesus who is God, of being an evil spirit. A demon. They did it in the most blasphemous way possible and Jesus says I will hide the truth from you in parables. But what do we learn from that? Uh, what are we to, to take from it today? Well one thing we should take from it is that we need to be really careful in how we respond to Jesus' word. We need to be careful in how we respond to what he says. <coughs> we have to be careful of rejecting him and his claims about being the good God when we hear them simply stated. But the great thing about Jesus is he's wonderfully patient. He's wonderfully kind. He won't turn away anyone who comes to him, no matter what they've done. He wants you to receive the salvation he offers if you haven't yet come to him. But the Bible does teach that if we go on rejecting him continually, then eventually it's too late, isn't it? Eventually it's too late. Uh, be careful what you do with Jesus. 
I remember being struck by this myself when I was younger. I had the privilege of growing up in a, a Christian home. I heard the, the gospel taught to me by my own parents as well as people at the church I grew up in as well. But I do remember the preacher one day talking about, be careful how you hear, because you're hearing the gospel now, but, but one day it may be that if you keep rejecting it, you wander away from those people who tell you the gospel, you may never hear it again. You'll never hear a call to repentance again. It'll be hidden from you and it'll be too late. I'll be honest, that shook me up and that scared me, but God used it for good ultimately. And I came to faith when I was 16. But those thoughts are in the back of my mind, remembering that now is the day of salvation. Don't put it off. It may be too late. The gospel may be hidden from you if you don't come to Jesus when you hear his call. So does what Jesus has said about parables mean that everything we thought we knew about them goes out the window then? Can we not actually learn much from them at all? They're just there to, to confuse certain people. Uh, thankfully, though, for those who will hear Jesus, the parables actually can be incredibly helpful in understanding the gospel. They can help the light of God's truth shine more clearly. Now, that's the second thing that Jesus has to say about the parables. It's actually further on in the chapter in verses 21 and 22. And he is still talking, I think, about parables here. He said to the disciples, Is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. So you might have noticed back in verse 11 when Jesus spoke about parables and, and what they were for, he said that part of what they're for is hiding the secret of the kingdom of God, hiding it from people. And again here in verses 21 and 22, he talks about things being kept hidden and secret some of the time. Now the secret thing is that the good news about the kingdom of God, the gospel, uh, the gospel is like light then in verses 21 and 22. But a light can't do anyone any good if it's hidden underneath something. Uh, like a basket or a bed, as Jesus says in verse 21. It's a good point, isn't it? Uh, you don't put your, your lights in your room underneath the table or underneath the bed or behind the sofa. You don't do that. But for some people, parables acted like actually a basket or a bed over the light. The light was there, but the parable was hiding it. On the other hand, though, for a light to be, to be seen, putting it on a stand is a good idea. A stand doesn't hide a light, it makes it more visible and useful. So a parable, though, can, if it's used correctly, also act a bit like a stand for a light. Holding it up high so that it can be seen more, far more clearly the gospel than if it was down on the floor underneath something. That's good, isn't it? That's good. I still remember in the, the early days of uh, being here in Ingleton when I first came uh, 10 years ago. I think it was within the first two years. Uh, someone who's a member of our congregation now came to church for the first time at our church. Uh, and sat there in the congregation, and we were actually looking at this parable as it's recorded in Luke. And as she listened to the parable being taught and explained from God's word, how it pointed uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ and the need to respond in repentance and faith to the gospel, she was saved. She put her faith in Jesus. The lights switched on for the first time. So, of course, parables can actually be exactly how we usually think of them. They, they help uh, God's word to shine brightly, the gospel to shine brightly. And that's good, isn't it? We don't need to write off parables altogether. They can be helpful. Illustrations can be helpful in order to bring out the truth, in order to make it more clear so that we repent and find forgiveness in Jesus. So that's quite a long first point. Let's come to a second point, though. Given all of that, uh, be careful how you hear, says Jesus. You see, it's Jesus who ultimately decides whether his parables, in fact, his word as a whole, leave people in confusion or with understanding. The fact that it's ultimately Jesus who decides 
does not mean that, that you play no part, that I play no part as we listen. Because for our part, Jesus urges us to, to listen to him, listen carefully. This chapter is full of that, isn't it? Verse 3, as he begins the first parable in this chapter, listen is his command. Listen. Verse 9, he says, he, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Again in verse 23, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And what's more, verse 24, pay attention to what you hear. Obviously, Jesus doesn't think it's completely pointless to speak in parables to anyone who's willing to listen. To those who do acknowledge him as king. But we have to listen carefully. And we have to keep on listening. So let's listen to what the, the parable of the sower is all about. You may know it very well, in which case it will be a reminder for you. What is it about? Well, it tells this story of a, a sower sowing seed. How are we to hear the gospel truths that are hidden in the parable? Well, the most important thing we are to do is what the disciples do in verse 10. This is where we begin. Look at what they do in verse 10. They're asking Jesus, in effect, to give them understanding. They're asking Jesus to give them understanding. You see, ultimately, it's only Jesus who can lift up the basket, lift up the bed, take out the light of the gospel and put it on a stand so that you can see it. And he'll often use means to do that. So he might use a, a Christian book that you read that explains God's word. And it's like that stand that the light is put on so that it shines and you see it. It might be a preacher that you've heard preaching the Bible, preaching the gospel. It might be a conversation with another Christian. I'm sure that if I asked everybody now for how they were converted, it would, some would be sat in a church service hearing a sermon preached. Others, it might be reading a particular book. Others, it might have been a work colleague explaining the gospel or a family member when you were very young explaining God's word to you. Jesus uses means, but it's Jesus who does it, who helps you to hear and to listen. So we must ask him to help us. Help me understand this. Help me see it. Help me hear it. So with that in mind and, and doing that, his explanation begins in verse 14. The sower, he says, sows the word, God's word, the word of the gospel. So these, this word, this seed is being scattered on paths, on rocky soil, on weedy soil and on good soil. And it's the word of God. It's the gospel that says repent and believe in Jesus. At next, verse 15, Jesus tells us what the path represents. It's people who hear the gospel. Somebody has told it to them in some way, but it's in one ear and out the other. They just don't engage with it at all. Uh, we might say it just went whoosh, straight over the head. Uh, the devil is involved in this, Jesus says. The birds are a picture of him. He comes and he takes the word away instantly before it makes any impression at all. Then we move on to the rocky ground, verse 16. Who does the rocky ground represent? They're people who hear the gospel. Initially, they think it's great, it's fantastic. They receive it with joy. But sadly, it doesn't take much for them to abandon it again. It only actually has a superficial effect on them. It never actually takes root in their heart. As soon as it becomes clear that being a Christian makes some things in life harder, verse 17, they abandon calling themselves a Christian. We have to be on guard against that all the time, don't we? That, that we don't end up being those who are like that, the rocky ground. When the going gets tough, do we keep leaning into Jesus, trusting him rather than giving up? What about thorny ground? Who are they? Well, again, they hear the gospel. They start out really, really well. They give every impression of having truly repented and believed. But, says Jesus, verse 19, the cares of the world and deceitfulness of riches and desires for other things enter in and choke the word, 
and it proves unfruitful. Other things, in other words, become more important than Jesus. That whatever signs of spiritual life there might have been, they're soon choked to death. Now, they might be things that are worrying things that just push out Jesus, that take over our life. There might be things that we really enjoy, but because we enjoy them so much more than Jesus, they also push Jesus out the picture. But they leave no spiritual life. Notice that all these first three groups of people, they have heard the word, haven't they? They've heard it. They've heard the gospel. This isn't a parable about some people who don't hear, who don't listen, and some people who do. Everybody has heard it. Everybody has listened in that sense. But it's only the last group that we come to in these last verses that keep listening and therefore produce a crop, produce fruit. The last group are good soil. In other words, they're the ones who hear the word and they accept it. They bear fruit because they keep listening. They keep hearing Jesus. They keep on taking him at his word. So which type of soil are, are you this morning? I hope it's not in one ear and out the other. I hope it's not the case of being that rocky ground where everything starts off very enthusiastic but soon dies away. I hope it's not the other group who start out enthusiastic but then other things, well, they become more enthusiastic about them. I hope it's that, that last group. Someone who keeps listening to Jesus. I wonder how you've found it during four months now, is it, of lockdown, to keep listening to Jesus? I think for many of us, it, it will have been a challenge, won't it? I don't know about you, but I, I do find it harder to listen to a preacher, for example, via a screen like this than I find it in person. I find it hard. Ah, I find it difficult. As time's gone on, I think I probably find it harder to pick up a book and read as well. I've got more and more tired. Maybe you have too. But we need to desperately then ask for Jesus' help to keep on listening, reading his word ourselves, listening to it being taught, whether that's via a book or, or via someone preaching on screen, uh, talking to one another when we can to encourage one another in the word. Uh, we need to keep listening so that we don't end up like one of the, the bad soils found in this parable. Uh, we need to keep being fed on Jesus' word. Be careful how you hear, says Jesus. Keep listening. Let's remember there's nothing more vital and more precious than the Lord Jesus Christ. I think that the thing is that we feel that more and more, the more and more we feed on him, don't we? Have you noticed how the less you listen to Jesus and the, the less you feed on Jesus, the less hungry you somehow feel? You may have noticed that. If you've realised that's happened, the alarm bell should go off. I need to start listening again. I need to get back to, to being close to him again as I can be by his help. Yes, it's challenging. It's difficult. But we need to ask him then, Lord, help me to understand. Help me to listen. Help me to hear so that I don't stop growing and bearing fruit. But I keep growing and keep bearing fruit and keep enjoying you. Time listening to Jesus is never wasted. It's vital. Uh, be the soil then that accepts the word of the gospel and then keeps listening to Jesus so that you will be fruitful. Let's come to our last point though as we close. And that last point is keep sowing the word. Keep sowing the word. Jesus rounds things off for us in the part we're looking at this morning with just two more parables. They're parables that teach us about how God's kingdom grows as we scatter gospel seed. Uh, sometimes it can feel like we're not making an awful lot of progress uh, when it comes to seeing people brought into God's kingdom. I wonder if that's particularly the case at the moment. Uh, when this whole pandemic started and we, we dashed online and, and started putting videos on YouTube and churches around the world were doing that, uh, one of the great things was well, suddenly we realised there's that many more listeners. 
We could see the number of people hitting the, the watch button, clicking on their laptops and their, their iPads and so on. But of course, we don't know who they are. And it can all start to feel a little bit, well, what's going on? Is anything actually being achieved when we don't know if anyone's being converted or not? We can start to feel a bit helpless again. Is the gospel actually taking root in anyone's life? Has the kingdom stopped growing, actually? We can feel helpless. Well, the reality is that we are. We are helpless when it comes to making the gospel seed take root in people's lives so that it produces fruit. That's the point of Jesus' parable in verses 26 to 29. Let me just read them now. Mark 4, 26 to 29. And Jesus said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. And when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. So part of what Jesus is saying there is a a farmer sows his seed. He's got no idea and no real control over which seeds grow. Now, modern farming methods perhaps give us a bit more of an idea, but 2,000 years ago, this was very true. The farmer would sow his seed. He's got no idea of what's happening underneath the ground as it grows. No control over which ones grow and which ones don't. But in the end, verse 29, lo and behold, a harvest comes. And Jesus is saying, keep sowing the seed. Keep doing it. Keep proclaiming the gospel. Keep making the gospel known through whatever means you can. That's our task. Don't get too depressed and down if you can't see what's happening underneath the soil. As we really can't at the moment a lot of the time. God produces the growth exactly where he wants it to grow. That's his task and he'll do it. So don't worry. Sometimes we can perhaps feel that the seed we're sowing isn't that powerful. We can lose confidence in the gospel. It looks small and insignificant. Well, look at what Jesus says in verses 30 to 32. Jesus said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. So the gospel, God's kingdom, it's like a tiny, tiny little mustard seed. And they are tiny if you've ever seen one. They look like nothing much at all. And yet once planted, Jesus tells us, it grows up to become one of the largest plants in the garden. So large that even birds can nest in it as though it were a tree, verse 32. That's for our encouragement. Don't lose confidence in the gospel. Let's not lose confidence. It does produce an everlasting kingdom. It will be greater than any kingdom ever seen. And nothing can thwart that. Nothing at all. Not a pandemic. God brought this pandemic. Not government restrictions that we're having to deal with at the moment. Nothing will thwart its growth. Sometimes when we put the gospel out there, people will hear it but completely ignore it. True. Sometimes they'll hear it, seem to accept it with joy, but disappear when the going gets tough. True. Sometimes they'll hear it, start out well, but then other things will become a greater priority. True. But sometimes we will put out the good news of the gospel, not even necessarily knowing who's hearing it. And it will be accepted with joy. It will bear fruit. The total number in that ask category will end up being greater than anyone can count. More than the stars in the sky, more than the sand on the seashore. That's amazing, isn't it? And nothing is going to stop that. So as I close, last words, let's keep sowing the word of the gospel. However we can for our own growth, so that we produce fruit, and for kingdom growth, so that people are brought into the kingdom as God's word goes out. Let's pray.
Father God, we thank you for the seed of the gospel. Uh, We thank you that it's taken root in our hearts. Uh, Lord, that through no particular um, credit to us, our hearts proved good soil and you planted the seed there and caused it to grow. We thank you for that, for your mercy to us. Uh, We pray that through this time in particular, that it can be tough to listen to the word for some of us, perhaps. Lord, that you would keep us listening to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you would keep us feeding on him so that we continue to grow. And we pray for every attempt to to get the gospel out as well. Uh, We pray that as people tune in that that we don't know, both to our own services and to, to what people are doing in other churches around the country, including ones that have now opened up and are welcoming visitors in, Uh, we pray that the gospel seed would take root in people's hearts and that it would bear good fruit. We ask these things for, for our good and for your glory. In Christ's name. Amen.